The technology works. That's wonderful. <laughs> it's always nice when it works. Well, it's good to be with you this morning and uh, back in Alstonville after uh, 22 years away. Well, we've been back since, but I mean, we haven't lived here for 22 years. And it was very difficult leaving because Alstonville is a lovely place to live, isn't it? And uh, so, uh, there we go. So our topic this morning is creation, a key to the gospel. And uh, that's why I'm involved in this. As I said to Ros and, uh, when she asked me a while ago, it's because it's about the gospel that, that's, that this is important. And uh, sadly today we have some of our theologians telling us it's a side issue. I want to tell you and I'll show you this morning hopefully that it's not a side issue, it's actually foundational to everything. The fir- in fact, the first verse in the Bible is no accident. It says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Everybody's heard of that, haven't they? Everybody here has heard of that, but has everybody out there heard that? Uh, and what is the view out there? Uh, do we ha- hear people talking about God creating things at university? What about a school, the school curriculum? Maybe if you're in a Christian school, and might, hopefully. <laughs> uh, what about in uh, the newspapers? God creating things? Uh, what about uh, nature documentaries on television? God creates things? What about when you go to a national park and you read the signs there? God created it? Hmm. What's the story they tell? Evolution. Everything made itself. There's a big bang billions of years ago. Here we all are, we're a cosmic accident. This is the scientific view, supposedly. Well, as a scientist, I find that irrational, but anyway. This view is summarised by this guy, Sir Julian Huxley, who's head of UNESCO for many years, and he, uh, UNESCO is the organisation responsible for the welfare of children. So this guy was ahead of that. He said, in the evolutionary pattern of thought, there's no longer either need or room for the supernatural. The earth was not created, it evolved. So do all animals and plants that inhabit it, including our human cells, mind and soul, as well as brain and body. So do religion. We invented God. God didn't invent us. This is the worldview which permeates society today from the ground up. It's not that God created us. We created God. In fact, you go to university and study religion, you'll study how we created God. In fact, you study theology, you'll study how you know, the Bible's just a concoction of people. It's not God's word. And so this is what permeates our society today. And there's a professor at Cornell University by the name of William Provine, and uh, he's an atheist, and he said, evolution is the greatest engine of atheism ever invented. Evolution is the greatest engine of atheism ever invented. So what are they teaching right through society? They're teaching evolution. What are they generating? Atheists. Do you know that survey in Melbourne schools recently, year 10 students, half of them said they're atheists. Half of them. They say, oh, well, that's still half of them. They're not atheists. Well, if you ask the others what they believe, most of them believe in the force. Star Wars. Buddhism. So how many are Christians? Tiny minority. In fact, most classes of 30, there might be one or two. We we live in a time when there's been an apostasy, a complete turning away from God, and it's based on this evolution lie. In the United States, which is uh, particularly in the South, has still got a very strong Christian ethos, but it's very quickly being lost as the government has mandated the teaching of evolution in the schools and excluded anything else. And uh, George Barner does research there about Christian trends, And uh, he found this. He said that six out of ten somethings actively involved in the church, so these are people actually actively involved in the church uh, during their teen years, failed to translate that into active spirituality during their early adulthood. So even those are in church, 60% are dropping out. And the Southern Baptist reckons it's 88%. I don't know whether that's a reflection on what they're doing, but anyway... Um, but it's, it's, it's horrendous. Even the kids that are in church, do you know kids that have been in church, gone off to university and then lost interest? You do. What's happened? It's, this is what's happened. They've been indoctrinated in a different worldview and they can't see how it fits with a Christian faith. It doesn't fit. It's an alternative. In fact, this young lady here uh, was uh, a youth leader in a church in Melbourne 
And she said this, I used to beat my head against the wall wondering why we lost all our young people about age 16. In the last few years I realised that age 16 or year 10 is when they teach evolution in depth in science. I've also discovered that some of the teachers actually identify the Christian students and make a special point of explaining the differences and difficulties in reconciling Genesis and the facts of evolution. It's no wonder we lost them. I come near to tears just thinking about it. Well, she, once she realised what the problem was, she actually addressed it and started teaching the young people in church about this, these issues. Preparing them to think, uh, teaching them how to think about these things so they didn't lose their way. And you can do that. Young people don't have to lose their way. If they're taught this at church, and don't just assume they're going to sort of get, get by, then they will thrive at university. There's a lot of good stuff to learn, but you've got to learn, you've got to, got to be discerning, learn discernment. So we're going to do a bit of work today on these issues and give you a, a, a bit of a heads up about how to deal with these things and how to teach your children. Apostle Paul leads the way here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, where he said, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it be into Christ. So you know, notice what it says there, we demolish atheists. Is that what it says? Now it says we demolish arguments, but of course in our politically correct culture, when you demolish somebody's arguments, you're intolerant, aren't you? <laughs> well, we have to be intolerant, otherwise people will never learn the truth. But be intolerant in their sense, not be uh, abusive, because elsewhere it tells us to do this with gentleness and respect. So we have lots of resources, and you probably walked past the tables as you came in there today and saw some of them, and uh, these are to help people with these issues. And... Um, uh, our flagship publication is Creation Magazine and it goes to over 100 countries around the world and we get enormous, incredible feedback about the magazine and how it impacts people. And a number of people here already subscribe, I know that. Uh, Answers book answers over 65 questions that people ask about these issues. We have in-depth material like the Journal of Creation. It's the peer-reviewed journal with the in-depth material with the research and so on uh, about design, about how design reveals a creator, a designer. Uh, refuting compromise about how all the different views that have been brought to, f to bear to try and marry evolution with the Bible or marry the Bible with evolution don't work. There's only one view that works and that is the Bible means what it says. And so the, uh, also the website, there's stacks of free material on the website. Uh, so there's over 11,000 articles now on the website. There's hundreds of videos and it's all free. Uh, you can buy stuff on there, but uh, there's just an enormous number of free resources on there, freely available to everybody. In fact, we have something like three and a half million people visit the website in a year, different people. It's enormous outreach. It's creation.com, hard to remember, isn't it? Creation.com, very easy to remember. We have, uh, because we have new material six days out of seven on the website, um, people get busy and miss things that they, maybe they shouldn't have missed, things that could you could use in witnessing. And so we put out an Infobytes, an email news, to keep you abreast of things. We do that about once a week. And also to tell you about events like this, about um, seminars and things that might come up in your area. So I have a little form you can fill in, and it looks like this. Sorry, it doesn't look like that. It looks like... Oh dear, I've got the wrong form. Anyway, I don't know what happened there. I picked up the wrong presentation. Um, anyway, um, there is a form. It doesn't look like this, but it has the same details on it. There it is, a yellow form that the lady's holding up over there. And uh, that's it, that's the one. That's what it looks like. But you'd fill in the same details, your, uh, email, your email address, and it's also got room for your name and your postcode. And uh, the postcode so we can tell you about events in your area. So you can fill that in at your leisure as you pass them around and when you're finished just pass them along. Put them on the floor at the end of the row and Leslie, where did Leslie get to? Leslie sort of disappeared, my wife. She has a habit of disappearing. No, she doesn't. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll introduce you to Leslie, uh, Leslie when she appears. Um, so um, anyway, the, uh, as you do that I'll talk about some of the issues. One of the things that really helped me enormously in all this 
was the understanding of the difference between what's called historical science and operational science. Now, by historical science, what are we talking about? We're talking about the whole idea of that we can know how the world came to be by studying the world in the present. So they dig up a fossil, for example, and this story goes that like this, this fish was evolving towards becoming a land creature that was our ancestor. That's the evolution story, isn't it? Did anybody observe that? Is there any experiment you can do on that? No, it's not. It's a story. Not observable, not repeatable. No experiments are possible on history. So why does it even qualify as science? What's it, how's it even being taught as science? When we say science, we're really talking about operational science, which is how the world operates, studying how the world operates. What caused a tree to die? That was my field uh, of research in uh, horticulture. And, uh, and you know, why, why does a lychee flower in, in uh, spring, in September? Why does mango flower in spring and not in autumn? Why? So it's answering those questions, isn't it? And I worked that out with the lychee and the mango. What causes it to flower in spring? And uh, how we can manipulate that. So this is operational science. And somebody else, somebody disagrees with what I wrote about that, they can do and go and repeat the experiments or devise their own experiments to test the ideas that I put forward. So this, is a, this has given us wonderful insights into the world, operational science. And it's given us things like technology, like laptops and, uh, and uh, curing diseases, preventing diseases. We've still got a long way to go, of course, in that. The, uh, only God is the one who can heal anything. <laughs> and uh, in, in, his, uh, in his providence, he does that. But uh, just to reiterate here, science studies the repeatable, History studies the unrepeatable. So remember that. When someone gets up and says millions of years ago this or that happened, they're not talking science that can be tested in a laboratory. They're talking something that's not observable, not testable. Okay, so that just frees you up to be a bit sceptical. Right? Because when you hear that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius at sea level, I mean, you would have to be totally ignorant to disagree with that, wouldn't you? I mean, that, that's just a scientific fact. But there are no scientific facts when it comes to history, except that there are fossils, right? There are dinosaur fossils, they do exist. And then we have to have a story about how they got there. If you're going to think about them, you have to think about how do they get there. And uh, well, what about dinosaurs? Did they die out 65 million years ago like we, we saw in Jurassic Park and Jurassic World and so on? Did they? That's the evolutionary story. And that's what our young people, our kids, you know, primary school age kids love dinosaurs. They're really intrigued by them. They get their imaginations fired up. And, but they get with it. They get the evolutionary story. As young kids that are too young to even process the idea. But my Bible tells me in Genesis chapter 1 that God created the land animals on day 6 of creation week along with mankind. The land animals would include dinosaurs which means that dinosaurs and people lived together at the same time. So Fred Flintstone was accurate. Yes. Is there any evidence for that? Indeed there is. This is actually a cylinder seal found in the Middle East predating Jesus and when it's rolled into wax it produces a pattern like this. And you see the creature there that's on, the, on that cylinder seal. What is it? Perhaps it's a giraffe and the, the artist was drunk? No, it's, it, it's a very good representation of a type of dinosaur. Not one of the commonly known ones like uh, Brachiosaurus, Patasaurus, T-Rex or one of those that's well known. But it's actually a very good representation of one known as Tanistrophius. You're all about to say that, weren't you? And I just Googled for an image of Tanistrophius on the internet, found this one at jurassicparkwikia.com. So I didn't get our artist to draw it. Right? This is actually just straight off the internet. And here we have it, one based on res uh, reconstruction from the fossils. Here's one, obviously, an eyewitness account. There's actually hundreds of those sorts of uh, art forms around the world, tapestries, carvings, uh, uh, sculptures, paintings and things showing that people and dinosaurs lived together. Now, before 1841, if someone saw a dinosaur, they wouldn't have called it a dinosaur in English because the word didn't, didn't exist before 1841. But there are lots of stories of dragons in history, many of which actually sound very dinosaurian. 
And so there's abundant evidence that people and dinosaurs lived together. We also have scientific evidence they didn't die out millions of years ago in the, in the form of soft tissue, proteins, all sorts of uh, chemicals, organic chemicals in the bones, which if they were millions of years old would have already, already long since decayed and broken up and wouldn't be there. Okay, so the evidence is in the fossils themselves they didn't die out millions of years ago. In fact, that can be carbon dated as thousands of years old. Why don't they believe the carbon dates for the dinosaur bones? Because they don't fit their story. Which all goes to show that radiometric dating is only believed when it fits their story. So it's not a, an objective way of telling the age of something. So the evolutionary story is that worms change into people. In fact, they even say that bacteria change into people. Bacteria made themselves and they changed into everything that lives on Earth from mango trees to mice to elephants, mongooses, humans, everything, all just made themselves by the process of natural selection. So what's the evidence they present to students to convince them, to hoodwink them into believing that worms could change into people? Not that you have worms, but once you were a worm. Okay, what's the evidence that worms change into people? Well, here it is, the sort of thing that's presented to the students. Darwin, Darwin studied these finches in the Galapagos Islands and they're all sorts of beak shapes and uh, a nice fine beak like this one up here is good for probing into flowers and getting insects. This one over here, big fat beak, is not so good for that but it's good for cracking hard seeds for which the fine beak is not very good. Now you can see as the food supply varies with the good seasons and the bad seasons that these ones will do well when there's lots of flowers and insects. These ones won't do so well. But when there's actually a drought and the only food available is big hard seeds left over from the good times, these ones do well and these ones don't do so well. They die, die down in numbers. And so as you see, natural selection operates here to favour ones that are better adapted to the conditions. Now, I don't have a problem with that story. I don't have any problem with that story. But how does that demonstrate that worms change into people or that T-Rexes change into finches? Which is what they claim. Not the T-Rex, but with relative T-Rex is supposed to change into a finch. How does that demonstrate that? It doesn't demonstrate that at all. It's trickery. But they put to the students and say, oh, look, evolution just means change. Here's an example of change. Evolution's a fact. Get over it. Worms change into people. It doesn't follow. It doesn't follow at all. A variety in beaks does not even explain the origin of beaks. <laughs> Let alone how one thing could change into the other. In fact, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1 that God created fruit trees producing fruit with seed in them after their kind. In fact, every time, in ten times it says he made things after their kind. Things reproduce after their kind. It's the most established principle of biology that even a three-year-old understands. So when mum goes off to hospital to have a baby, she comes home with a human baby. Every time. Seven billion times on the earth today. And every chimp that has a baby has a chimp baby. But evolution is the idea, oh no, given enough time, chimps change into humans or chimp-like creature change into a human. Oh, and the fossils are supposed to show it. Do the fossils show it? No, they don't. In fact, they've gone very quiet on the fossils, generally speaking. Uh, yeah, you get ones thrown up in the newspaper every now and then about the, how they found this transitional, but when the dust dies down and you have a look at it, it doesn't show what they claim. In fact, talk about dinosaurs again, and this is, you're not going to see the details of this, but I'll colour it in to help you see it, because I had to just copy it out of the science journal. This is science, the number two science journal in the world. There's an article about the evolution of dinosaurs by the world expert in the subject, and we have all the different silhouettes of the dinosaurs at the top. You can see those, can't you, at the back? Well, I can see them at the back up there, so you should be able to see them at the, from the back up here. So here we've got T-Rex over here and a Patasaurus, Brachiosaurus. We've got uh, the, the one over here, uh, like Stegosaurus and so on, and Hadrosaurus, all the different sorts of dinosaurs, silhouettes. And down the black, dark black lines, which you can also see, represent the fossil evidence down through the rock layers. Okay, you see that? The fossil evidence for Stegosaurus there, see that? Uh, and then as you go down through the, the diagram here, the, the lines and the bars and things, bars become open and the lines become dashed. Do you know why they're, they're, they're dashed? I'll colour those in. I'll colour in the dashed lines and the open bars in red and blue. You see that now? See what I've done? Just to prove I'm not actually fiddling it. Right? I'll just colour in the 
the, the, the open bars and the dashed lines, you know what that is? That's imagination. The only fossil evidence of the dark black lines, the rest of it is imagination. If you erase the imagination, whoops, what happened to the evolution? There's none in the fossils. Now, you can't claim there aren't enough fossils to show the evolution because there's plenty of fossils showing the dinosaurs. There should be lots of fossils showing the evolution. Right? They can't be all missing. But they are because it never happened. It never happened. God created different kinds of dinosaurs back there in day six of creation week. So what about this ape man? I've seen the pictures in the paper. Yeah, that's right. You see pictures in the paper like this. This was in Time magazine. Meet your new found ancestor. Chimp-like forest creatures stood up and walked 5.8 million years ago. And you have a big long handle on it like Artipithecus rhombidus cadabra. And it makes it sound very scientific and factual, doesn't it? As good scientists, you would start to ask the question, well, let's artist reconstruction. What was the actual evidence for this? Do you know what the evidence for that was for? That, that diagram, the evidence for that artist reconstruction was actually a toe bone. <laughs> Seriously, it's a toe bone. And this was published in Nature, the world's number one science journal. Absolute, unmitigated rubbish. Published in the number one science journal in the world. Why do they publish such rubbish? Because they want to believe they're made in the image of apes rather than made in the image of God. Because if they're made in the image of God, then they have to bow their knee before our Creator. And they don't want that. At no cost can they have that. See, modern science, operational science, shows us that evolution is impossible. You've heard of DNA, haven't you? National Dyslexic Association? No, no, of course not. It's the stuff of inheritance, isn't it? It's genes, it's chromosomes, and it's the stuff of inheritance. The DNA is constructed of, of these chemical letters. So if you're going to make a microbe, the DNA of a microbe has to have a, quite a lot of instructions for how to make the components to make more microbes, and so the microbe can have enzymes to digest its food and so on, to make chemicals, make uh, components for new microbes. Do you know that the amount of information we're talking about in a microbe, the simplest microbe, if you wrote it out in a book, it would be the size of a Bible. The simplest microbe. So if, if you're going to believe that life made itself, you've got to believe that a book like the Bible just pop into existence in a chemical soup on earth or something or other. Chemical soup doesn't work, but we, we don't have time to go into that. We can, we can go into that tonight if you like to ask a question about it. But a chemical soup doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work even to get the components of life, let alone getting life. But we're talking about all these instructions. We're not just about talking about chemistry. We're talking about instructions on the DNA. And instructions have to be read by apparatus in the cell. So it's not just, there's no good having a Bible in English if you read Chinese, is it? Right? You've got to have a Bible that you can read in your language. So there's a language in the cell, there's an, there's a, a, a translation system which translates the instructions on the DNA into proteins fundamental building blocks of life and proteins are incredibly complex so you can't get the first life but assume you did they claim it changed into all the living things on earth including like horses so if you're going to change a microbe into a horse you have to add stacks more books of information in fact we're talking about for all the features that the horses have that microbes don't have you need all the instructions how to make hair how to make skin how to make blood and so on talking about humans we're talking about a thousand books on our DNA, a thousand books, like a little small library of information on our DNA. Each cell has a thousand books of information. We have 3,000 million letters on our DNA. Three billion letters on our DNA. There are four letters, uh, in, the, in four chemical letters. So we have 26 in our alphabet, but there's four in the, in the DNA alphabet, and three at a time are read to, uh, together to give you 64 different options for um, for the amino acids that make up the proteins. But there are lots of other stuff that the DNA does as well in terms of controlling what is produced and where it's produced. Our bodies can make over 100,000 proteins. Proteins are, range from uh, 50 or 60 amino acids strung together, 20 different amino acids, up to thousands, many thousands of amino acids. Some of the basic proteins that are necessary for life have five to ten thousand amino acids in the right order so take 20 at a time you've got 20 so you choose from 20 the chances of getting 
say 10 amino acids in the right order is 1 over 20 to the power of 10. So 1 over 20 times 1 over 20 times 1 over 20 times 1 over 20. You quickly see the chances of getting any protein by some random process, which is the only thing that evolution has going for it, is impossible. In fact, not even one protein would form if the whole universe was an experiment for all the billions of years they claimed for it. Not even one protein. I would debate this with anybody at a university, but they won't debate it because they know they, get, they, know, they, know, they know they lose. They will not debate it. They have the megaphone now, so they won't even engage in debates because they know that they get beaten. So where did the information come from? Where did we get the 999 books to change a microbe into a human? Mutations created all the new information, they say. It's the only game in town. What are mutations? They're copying mistakes. Where did you get your information from? You got it from your parents. That's what the birds and the bees is about. You got about half of it from Dad and about half of it from Mum. That's why you're a bit like Dad and a bit like Mum. Hopefully the best of both, not the worst of both. So mutations are accidental copying mistakes when the information is passed from parent to child. And these accidental mistakes you would not expect to generate Superman, but you would expect them to cause you to have defects. In fact, mutations are known as the defects they cause because random changes to complex coded information doesn't generate new information. It actually just destroys or degrades the existing information. Now sometimes those degrading of inf that degrading of information can be useful, even for survival, but it's still a degrading of information. And so there are some helpful mutations, but they're still degrading the information. Take, for example, this uh, rooster here with no feathers. Uh, mutation in the information for making feathers uh, results in a rooster being unable to make feathers. And um, is it improved? From the point of view of the rooster, it's going to fry in summer and freeze in winter, especially on a day like today. Wouldn't be nice, it's nice being out in the weather with uh, that no feathers, would it? And TNR is very technical. It stands for TNR stands for totally naked rooster mutant. <laughs> <coughs> See, that's what mutations are known for. In fact, we have over a thousand human diseases. In fact, the tally is up to something like four and a half thousand human diseases known to be caused by mutations. There's a whole website devoted to the mutations that cause disease. And you know some of them, like cystic fibrosis, for example, haemophilia, and others. These are inherited things that we get from our ancestry but they can pop up new as well so mutations are destroying us they're not creating us we're not becoming superman we're becoming x-men the x-men the, the x-men is a is science fiction that mutations generate all these fantastic features on these people but in reality mutations make us ex-men they're destroying us not creating us in fact as a Major studies in this in recent years have shown that the number of mutations that we are getting each generation are actually measurably deteriorating the human population and every other population of creature on the earth. In fact, it puts a very strict limit on how long we could have been here. Did God create things with mutations? Did God create things with a propensity for mutations? No, originally everything was perfect and in the beginning uh, everything was good. This came about because of rebellion of mankind against God when God withdrew some of his sustaining power and things started falling apart. And we see that in big measure today. Now what we're finding inside living things also screams at us that must have been created by a super intelligent creator. Right now inside you and me is a delivery system delivering parcels inside our cells. And just in the last 15 years or so this has been discovered and, and uh, elucidated but a lot has yet to be discovered about it. But this is actually uh, what it looks like, an animation of it. And, uh, and um, let me see if I can get that to work. Ha, there we go. Um, and uh, so the, this is called Kinesin. It's actually a delivery system. It walks around a road network inside our cells. And... It's in this bag are proteins being delivered to the site in the cell where they're needed. So the proteins get actually manufactured with an address label on them to say where they're needed in the cell, where they're to be taken to. They could be taken outside the cell. 
And so the address label is read by the cell, and then they're packaged up in a package and then taken off to the destination. For example, they might need to go to the mitochondrion to build the new mitochondrion. And so these package of proteins are delivered to the site. Now, bacteria don't have that delivery system, but we do. So bacteria are going to become, if microbes are going to become microbiologists, they need to invent this delivery system. Now, this is the point here, is that even to get just that single protein, which is about 300 amino acids long, uh, would never happen. But you don't need, just need the protein, because if you had the protein didn't have the road network, it wouldn't be able to walk anywhere. Uh, if you didn't have the package of proteins, it wouldn't be covering, carrying anything, it would just be wasting energy. You need the whole thing has to work together for it to be useful at all. Right? So this is the fundamental problem for the evolutionary story, that it would never happen. If you think about natural selection, for example, uh, here's a couple of friendly looking dogs and uh, these red things represent genes for hair length. Okay, so it says, this one says make short, just say for example there's a pair of genes which determine hair length. This one says make short hair, this one says make long hair. They don't look like that of course, just drew them like that to make it look understandable. This was in Creation magazine. So when these uh, wolves have or dogs have offspring, they can have a short hair one, unlike mum and dad, because you get two short hair genes together. Everybody's done this in middle high school, some basic genetics, right? And so this shouldn't be terribly difficult for you. And uh, oh, that can be ones just like mum and dad, a short hair gene with a long hair gene either way. And you can get two long hair genes together. What do you get? A long haired wolf. <laughs> okay, which one's adapted to cold weather? Which one's adapted to the ice age that followed the flood? Actually, here we go. Obviously, the long-haired ones are better adapted to cold conditions, and these ones die off because they can't survive the cold. And then what happens? These ones can reproduce. They fall in love. They don't have much choice, do they? And they have babies. What sort of babies can they have? They only have long-haired babies because they lost a gene for short hair. Natural selection actually eliminates genes doesn't create anything, it eliminates things. So natural selection is not evolution. Natural selection only sorts existing information. You know what they do in school? They say Darwin's theory of, of evolution by natural selection and they present all these examples of natural selection and they say there you are, Darwin's, Darwin's theory is proven. Folks, that's trickery because natural selection does not generate the information required for evolution to be believable. Mutation is the only game in town for this to actually happen. So we might summarise this by saying neither mutations nor natural selection create the information needed. Evolution is an impossible process. So why do people believe it? Because they think it gets rid of God. They think it gets rid of God. In fact, this billboard in Arizona Praise Darwin, Evolve Beyond Belief, put up by the Freedom for Religion Foundation. It's the atheist creation myth. And they recognise if they can get society to think that the only game in town is evolution, they'll have got rid of God. And that's what this is about. It's about secularism. Secular means godless. It doesn't mean fair. It doesn't mean being fair to everybody. It means godless. Get rid of God. In fact, the word secular, secularism, was invented by an atheist by the name of George Holyoke in the United Kingdom in the middle 1800s when he was trying to get traction for atheism and couldn't get anywhere. And he said, atheism's on the nose with people. We need to call it something else. You know what he called it? Secularism. And they talk about us living in a secular state. No, the founders of our constitution were not secularists. They founded the Constitution with the recognition that we are under God and stated in the Constitution. We are not a secular state at all. Now, of course, we shouldn't have a, an official church. That's very different. Right? I agree with that. But to say we're a secular state means we're a non-Christian, godless state. I don't accept that. But that's what happened. And this do doctrine of evolution has been the... the, the uh, it's been the mechanism by which the atheists have taken over society. Meanwhile, what's happened in the church? What's happened? Have our theologians been standing against this? By and large, no. They've been silent. 
In fact, people in the church have been silent for 150 years, by and large. And they've erected all sorts of ways of trying to marry the two together. But any way you want to marry them together, the days are long periods of time, there's a gap between the first couple of verses of Genesis, you shove all the millions of years into the gap. Uh, it's just poetry or it's a different form of literature or it's myth or it's whatever. You, however you want to slice and dice it, you, they fit in the millions of years. The millions of years are in the rock layers. They're not just some sort of figment of the imagination supposedly. Well, they are, but uh, they, they claim they're in the rock layers. In the rock layers are dead things, fossils, like the dinosaur fossils. And those fossils are a record of pain, death, killing, disease, thorns, struggle for survival, suffering and extinction over millions of years hundreds of millions of years, but when God had finished creating everything, he said it was all very good. Is that very good? It's very good. Everything's very good. In fact, here's Adam and Eve in the garden, and it's all perfect. It's paradise. But all those schemes that want to marry the Bible or make the Bible compatible with evolution, with or without its millions and billions of years, it can even have billions of years without evolution, some sort of progressive, progressive creation idea, all they do, all those schemes have to put the dead things under the feet of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And those dead things represent death and suffering and disease over eons of time. There's only one view that doesn't actually do that, that is God created everything in six days just like the Bible says. In fact, Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, which I shouldn't have to quote here, God, establishing the Sabbath commandment, said he created the heavens, the earth, the seas, and everything in them in six days and rests on the seventh, based on a seven-day week. Why did he take so long? Based on a seven-day week. God could have done it in a flash if he wanted to. The thing that unlocked all this for me as a young student trying to believe in evolution and the Bible was to realise the importance of the flood in understanding the history of the world. The flood is a key to understanding history. Noah's ark was a, made, a big boat. See the scale for, see the semi-trailer, see the people? Korean naval architects estimated it could carry 15,000 tonnes. If there was a flood like the Bible talks about, there would be a massive mud bath burying things and it would create fossils like this fish in the middle of lunch. We'll talk more about, more about this tonight. But, uh, you know, the Dinosaur National Monument in the United States has dinosaur fossils and sea creatures buried together in a mass graveyard. This is in Creation magazine. You go to things like Grand Canyon, it's a massive monument of the flood. The layers there were laid down, they're mud layers which have become rock. This coconut sandstone covers over 500,000 square kilometres in the United States, 100 metres thick, and there are big sand dune structures in it called cross bedding, which show it was laid down underwater in quick time, days, not millions of years. And layer after layer in the Grand Canyon indicates that, and the canyon itself was carved by the water coming off the land at the end of the flood. In fact, if you come across eastwards from here, you find a place called the Kaibab Upwarp, and here's the people for scale here, where all the layers in the Grand Canyon there are bent radically. You see the radical bending of the rock? How do you bend rock? Folks, this rock had to be soft when it was bent. What does that mean? Well, you look at the evolutionary story, and they say this layer here was laid down 550 million years ago, this was laid down 250 million years ago, then the bending didn't occur until 70 million years ago, 180 million years after this was laid down, all that material would have been hard rock when it was bent, but it actually wasn't, it was soft rock. Because it was all laid down very quickly in the flood. You know, this observation alone blows away 480 million years of imaginary evolutionary time. as most of what they call the Phanerozoic, which is the fossil record of complex organisms. Things like, uh, Grand, this is up near Mount St. Helens Volcano in the United States, in the northwest of the United States, the volcano erupted in 1980. About two years later, there's a mud flow down the hill, carved out this canyon in less than a day. Can you imagine the mud flying off the land at the end of the flood? You can't actually, it's massive. But just try and imagine the amount of mud coming off the land at the end of the flood as the waters flow back into the oceans. And, uh, and, and the mud flowing, it would have carved canyons, like Grand Canyon, and canyons all around Australia, and river valleys. 
you know, geographers talk about river, rivers being underfit. In other words, look at this little creek here. Can you imagine that creek carving that? You have to imagine a lot more water flowing in the past. And so as they talk about underfit rivers, they're underfit because they didn't carve the valleys. The valleys were carved by the water coming off the land at the end of the flood. Think, think about this. Initially the water would be coming off in sheets. So we got laminar flow as it's up uh, above the land and it would carve uh, plateaus like the Blue Mountains west of Sydney and uh, there's lots of plateaus all around the world, Grand Canyon Plateau. And then as the water channels, as the water's coming down to the, land of the, le the level of the land and it has to channel, if there's a little bit of a dip in the land, it'll start to flow into the dip and then all the water with its mud will flow into the dip and rapidly carve out the valleys. This is what we see around the world, all around the world. Once you get this in your head, you see it everywhere. You see it everywhere. You see, folks, if there is a creator, the creator gave law, we break God's law, that's sin. We're going to be judged for our sin. That's why we need a saviour. If there's no creator, what about the rest of it? Do you have trouble witnessing to people that are just not interested? Of course. Those of you who don't nod, don't witness. So if there's no creator, all that just, there's no basis for it. And that's what we find today, trying to witness to people. They say, look, I'm not interested in you, Jesus. Don't talk about it. Now, Jesus said, I have, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that may have life and have it abundantly. The thief, Satan, comes to steal and kill and destroy. I believe this doctrine of evolution is stealing, killing and destroying. In fact, it's destroying our nation. Anybody shaking your head at disbelief that they're talking about two blokes getting married? Can you believe that? Can you, anybody been around more than, you know, 40 years, you think about, can you can imagine 30 years ago anybody even contemplating two blokes getting married? I mean, is that bizarre or not? It's completely mad bizarre. But our federal parliament are falling over themselves to try and legislate for such a thing. They've got rocks in their heads. But you see, Romans chapter 1 says, when people abandon the knowledge of God, he gives them over to futile thinking. And we see it in spades in our country today. You know, teaching kids in primary school, oh yes, you look like a male, but you could be really a female inside, you know, you need to choose your own gender. That's what this so-called so safe schools program, the government is financing it. It's child abuse. And it's part of this radical, left-wing, atheistic, neo-Marxist agenda to destroy us. And this doctrine of evolution is foundational to it. The attack on God, attack on faith, attack on Christian faith. Because the only way standing, only thing standing in their way is, is a Christian church. We've got to get active, folks. We've got to get active or we're going to lose our families and lose our country. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. One of the greatest resources we have, this is Creation Magazine. Who gets Creation Magazine? A number of folk already get Creation. God bless you. Is it, is it worth getting? Is it worth getting, Gary? <laughs> Well, you wouldn't be getting it if you didn't think so. Um, but uh, it comes out four times a year. We get some fantastic feedback about Creation Magazine. I mean, uh, your magazine and all the evidence it presents to reinforce the truth, eliminate even the smallest doubts, says Justin from the United States. I just got your mag good magazine, Creation, from the letterbox. I realised I experienced a little thrill as I slid it out of the box. Do you get a thrill, Gary, when you get it? <laughs> Do you realise the effect you have on people? But this is the sort of thing I love to hear, and we hear this all the time. I was converted when someone gave me a creation magazine. Then I subscribed for five of my relatives. Four of them have now come to the Lord. This guy up at Gympie in Queensland. And I could tell you story after story after story like that. There's a form that you can fill in and it doesn't look like this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you can uh, fill in the form and uh, put your, uh, your name and everything. And uh, whether you want a one-year subscription or a three-year subscription... Uh, there and you can get a digital version. A digital version, what's that? Well you get a, a link sent to you and you can just click on it and it opens up on your tablet 
or your computer. But here, you can actually share that with five people. Share it with up to five people. So you get the digital version, add it to the other, you can actually share that with other people. Just, and you share it with different people each time. You really spread it around, you know. Spread it around. You'll see people changed. People open up to the gospel. And uh, so you can fill in your details there and tick the sort of box you want. You'll see it on the form there. Leslie, Leslie has the forms there. Thank you, Leslie, come up. You, you haven't met everybody. This is Leslie, my good wife. Uh, <laughs> and Leslie very kindly come down with me. She doesn't, doesn't always travel with me, but this weekend being Olsonville and we can drive down together from Brisbane, it's been great to have Leslie with me for the weekend. So thank you, Gary. And uh, so, so go and see Leslie at the end there and... Uh, and uh, give you, give you, and uh, anyway, we'll send it, send you the bill in the mail and everything later on. So that's all, that will be done later. Uh, the free stuff, there's free stuff out on the table there. Have a look at that. This one about uh, can you tell the difference between evolution and natural selection? Not the same thing. There's a book out there, Stones and Bones, by my colleague Dr. Carl Wheeland, and uh, it's a great little presentation of some of the evidence for creation and why evolution doesn't work. And if you're not a Christian here this morning, if you're not a Christian, come and see me, I'll give you a copy for free. Uh, but if you, if you are a Christian, you can pay for it. But if you want to get something to, to this morning, if you want to get something this morning, you can get it on invoice. So we don't actually take in money or anything today, but you can get an invoice and then go away and fix it up later. Uh, but if you come back tonight, you can get stuff tonight. So it'll be after Sabbath tonight. And uh, so if you look at material and you're coming back tonight, you can get that stuff tonight. But if you can't come back tonight, then you can get stuff on invoice this morning and take that away. And uh, we'll trust you uh, to fix it up later. So the Answers book answers over 65 questions that people have about all these sorts of issues. And uh, we mentioned that a while ago. One of the, one of the things it deals with... So, yep. Yep. Thanks, Gary. Um, over 65 questions. Where did God come from? Anybody been hit with that one? You believe in God? Who made God? Um, what about, where do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? Uh, how did Noah fill the animals in the ark? Where did the water come from from the flood? What about continental drift? What about races? How can we have different races if we all came from Noah and his family? And so on. And we mentioned carbon dating a while ago, but it's actually evidence against their millions of years because if carbon-14 has a very short half-life, it means that if something was a million years old, there could be no carbon-14 in it. Right? Other techniques give them the millions and millions of years, but carbon dating itself is actually a problem for their millions and millions of years because if you take uh, virtually any bit of organic material, dinosaur bones, coal, oil, even diamonds, carbon date is thousands of years old. So why don't they believe they're carbon dates? Because they don't fit their belief system. I mentioned a while ago about some of the soft tissue and things in dinosaur bones. This is in the Creation, in the, uh, uh, creation Answers book as well, along with carbon dating. Um, but you've got blood vessels, blood cells. This scientist here said, this is not something I ever dreamed I'd see. Why? Because she believes in millions of years. And then they went ahead and they actually, this is stretchy blood vessels, when they dissolve the bone away. Here's the blood cells in the blood vessels. And they, then later they found haemoglobin, osteocalcin, and all sorts of proteins. Things like, um, there's so much evidence against their millions and millions of years. Uh, this is, illustrates how we all have the same skin colour. His two parents here had these twins. Someone's going to say, are they identical twins? <laughs> no, of course they're not identical twins. Uh, but this one, a white, a white child and a black child, if you like, twist twin sisters. Uh, because, you know, we all have the same skin colour. It's called melanin. If you have a lot of it, you're a, a, a dark person. If you have a lot, not much of it, you're a pale face. If you have a moderate amount, you're a brown person, somewhere in between. We all have different uh, amounts of melanin, but it's just different amounts of the same stuff. It's no big deal. And in fact, modern science catch up with the Bible. We all are descended from one man, Adam. One man and woman, Adam and Eve. And later on down the track, Noah and his family. Evolution's Achilles Heels, uh, the documentary. This is 15 PhD scientists. That animation I showed you a while ago is on there with other animations. Fantastic. There's a study guide. There's eight chapters. You can study it one chapter at a time. Uh, but who's seen Achilles' heels, Evolution's Achilles' heels? Gary's seen it. It is a phenomenal documentary, highly recommended. You could use it for studies uh, through home groups, cell groups. And the book, nine PhD scientists have written the book, is a very good, fantastic read, a lot more detail, of course, in the book. Genesis Account by Dr. Jonathan Safady, 
uh, first, first 11 chapters of Genesis, 800 pages, devotional, scientific and theological commentary, but very readable, very understandable. You'll find incredible stuff in there you've never thought about before. There's children's materials like this one, geology, exploring geology with Mr. Hibb. There's a whole set of DVDs there. You can do your own seminar, eight DVDs there on that material. The website, there's just all this free material, uh, all this free material on the website, creation.com. I just want to say, just wrap it up by saying, you know, evolution says death and suffering brought man into existence. Death and suffering over millions of years brought man into existence. But the Bible says man's actions brought death into God's good world. Adam rebelled against God. Adam and Eve rebelled against God. And God said, if they did that, death would come. Death came. Death and suffering. By the sweat of your brow, you'll eat food. Thorns and thistles came about because of sin. The bad stuff we see in today's world is because of sin. It should remind us of how bad sin is. big question people have is, how can you believe in loving God when there's so much suffering in the world? The suffering in the world came about because of sin. That's why Jesus died on the cross, to deal with the sin that brought the death and suffering. In fact, the why Jesus died is linked to the fact that Adam did it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, for as Adam all die, so in Christ all we made alive. We're all descendants of Adam, we all die, we all sin anyway, we deserve to die as well. But fundamentally, he was the federal head of the human race. So Jesus was the federal head of a new human race. See how it works? So in Christ, we are born again of the Holy Spirit into God's forever family, forgiven of our sins, and we can experience new life for eternity. We are saved from the consequences of sin, which is death, eternal death. So which man is not a, not a real person? See, our theologians tell us, many of us tell us, oh, Adam was just some sort of metaphor. Folks, if Adam was a metaphor, Jesus died for no reason. See, this is about the gospel. It undermines the gospel at its very roots. You see, the good news of the gospel tends to un depends on the bad news of the origin of sin and death. Without the bad news, there's no need for the good news. Sometimes we want to cut to the chase, just present the good news. Come to Jesus, have a good life. No, that's not what it's about. Come to Jesus for forgiveness, otherwise you're going to suffer the judgment of God. So there's a big picture here. We know the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. It says in Romans chapter 8, was it created groaning and suffering? No, it became that way because of sin. There it is in verse, the verse before it, the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption. It was enslaved because of sin. It's going to be set free from its slavery to sin because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, his death and his resurrection. So we look forward to a new heavens and a new earth. There's a perfect world in the beginning, destroyed through sin. There's going to be a restoration, a new heavens and a new earth in the future. Why is there going to be a restoration? Why is there going to be a new heavens and a new earth? Because the old heavens and earth are corrupt because of sin. They've been cursed. So there's going to be new heavens and new earth. Are you looking forward to that? As you get older, you look forward to it more. God bless you. Thanks for being here this morning. I hope it's been a help. Come back tonight. We'll deal with some other stuff. There'll be a little bit of overlap tonight for those slackers that weren't here this morning. But, um, but we'll deal with uh, other material tonight. The, the topic tonight is uh, answering the big questions. First question is, what are the big questions? <laughs> so we're going to deal with that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness to us in Jesus. Uh, that he came, that he died for us, that he rose from the dead, having conquered death, having paid the price for our sin on the cross. And so, Lord, I pray for anybody here who doesn't yet know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, that even this morning they would bow their knee before him, acknowledge their need of forgiveness, come to faith in him, trust him for that forgiveness, and know that life which is available through him. As the Holy Spirit comes in and changes us and brings us to be more like our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Pray, Lord, for anybody who is, is a Christian, who does love you, but has really been uh, plagued by doubt and really inactive in witnessing because of fears of what they don't know, what they don't believe, what might be. Lord, that you give them confidence in your word from beginning to end. And Lord, answer the questions that are needed, that we might be active agents in our society, that we might be out there sharing the gospel with those who are perishing, that we might see... Uh, Jesus magnified again in this country, I pray it in his name. Amen. Thank you.